the alchemists of Durs. Durs, a visionary scientist, once used darkness to try and spawn the perfect being as Merin had defined it to be. Hunted by the Acalanian Inquisition for heresy, Durs and his alchemists wandered for a long time before settling in the merciless Saharalna desert. Hidden by the dunes and by their mirages, they founded the alchemical empire of the Scorpion. Over the centuries, the alchemists of Durs, also known as Sahars, have built a civilization whose foundations are based on the mastery of life and of matter. Inspired by Ar Tolf, a god that came from elsewhere. They have perfected their sacrilegious knowledge and have mastered the powerful magic of darkness to create legions of clones and counter-natural creatures. Okay, so thanks very much, Eric, for coming back to the podcast or to the show, to our YouTube channel, to talk more about confrontation and its law. I'm, I'm happy to be here and I'll be happy to come back as long as you'll have me. I think Kelvin said through the week that you are officially now the law master. I think it was one of the unofficial titles I had in the English forums back then. Uh, I know a lot of people usually try to throw a, throw a, a message for me to uh, pay attention to threads here and there when there were lore questions. So yeah, I guess it's just a continuation of that. Well, that's a, that's a quite a quite a title to um, to have made and to be honoured with. So that's great. So today we're going to talk about your maybe most favorite faction of Arklish? Would that be right? Uh, it was the one that got me into the game. It was the one that caught my eye and caught my attention. Uh, basically, they are such great bad guys that you can't really hate them for it. Uh, yeah, every faction has its own thing. Some factions didn't grab me as much. I mean, goblins and dwarves never really were my thing. I know you really love goblins and great but to me it, it, feel, it felt like it wasn't as interesting as some of the more central factions uh, like the, the, the Ram, the Durs, uh, the Griffin but I mean that's where a lot of the, the, the fluff we got to see was located so yeah but we might as well start with one of the, the big ones so yeah let's take a dive to Durs. Yeah mate more of you already Eric? Please sure. give us a bit of a background overview about all the law behind the faction. All right. So as everything in competition is pretty much tied into one another, uh, the Durs are a offshoot of the Griffin, which are themselves an offshoot of the Lions, which are themselves an offshoot of the Celts. Uh, happening there? <laughs> it's, it <laughs> the really is, actually. It's uh, the human tribes came in from another continent, settled on Arklash. They were the uh, barbarians that turned into the Celts uh, with various tribes uniting into various sides. Uh, the Cicers were one of the last and one of the larger tribes, as are the Druns. Uh, two of the tribes, the Lanar and the Iliar, joined in uh, when they fought something, some, some monstrous beings called the Atrocities uh, into a single tribe, called, and which themselves turned into uh, the Lions. Uh, there, the various tribes turned into a kingdom led by one king, yada, yada, yada. Uh, one of the um, barons of that kingdom itself left to pursue a religious undertaking because he had a vision and uh, turned into basically the uh, Griffin Empire. Uh, that was... Uh, in 573, yes. I do. Sorry, I'm looking at the... Uh, the timeline on in the original French Ragnarok book. I know that timeline has been updated in uh, Age of Ragnarok. So Confrontation 4 had an updated timeline. Uh, they've tweaked some of the, the dates, for some of the years. Uh, I still think the original one was better. It felt less shoehorned in some instances. Uh, for example, the uh, various factions of darkness did their own thing. Uh, over a number of years in the original timeline and the Ragnarok, H. Ragnarok uh, plastic, the pre painted plastic timeline, it was all together in like the span of a year. And it, the original one felt better. So that's the one I'll be following for the lore. Uh, so, yeah, so basically, 
the various clans of Celts happened around uh, the year 50. Uh, the Lanar and Iliar happened around 200. Uh, the Kingdom of Alahan was founded around 419. And then uh, the Griffin Empire started around 573. Um, so the darkness, so basically uh, the ram splintered from Alahan in 60, 6, 675. Uh, the Durs heresy happened. So this is when Durs, who was a, a Griffin alchemist, uh, got unveiled as unmasked as a bad guy. Uh, that was in 676. Uh, the best way we can describe Durs himself, the man, uh, was as a fantasy, fantasy variation of Leonardo da Vinci. This was a man who had been, uh, who'd been getting very popular, very well known in the Griffin Empire as a free thinker. Uh, the uh, church at the time had tried to look into him further and he had gotten backing from the emperor uh, to, to be left alone. Uh, so basically the, the, the church kept, uh, kept that in mind and decided to go again at some point when he wouldn't have as much protection. Uh, so that was 576, that's when that happened. Uh, that, so they did the second trial, there's a second trial by the church at this point, the church branch was the Inquisition. It had formed into the Inquisition. Uh, brought there's the trial for uh, there's had gotten a dispensation, so he'd been allowed to use uh, darkness gems, so evil mana for experiments, uh, and that was basically what the Inquisition used to try and look into him and, and start questioning him. Uh, got brought to trial. His uh, followers, as he apparently had was popular enough to have following, uh, set loose some experiments and in the confusion, everyone just ran off. And so he fled to, uh, eastward to the desert where he, he and his followers found ruins uh, with old technology in it and then settled out uh, the various ruins. Uh, the, his better students got each got a special uh, spots like one ruin in the desert, which would be there to experiment, you know, to, to deal with. Uh, of course, the Inquisition and the the, the church, basically the entire uh, crusade. As he left, uh, as he he ran off, uh, the uh, trouble that it had caused uh, actually showed that he had been experimenting with dangerous and illegal and potential evil. Uh, philosophies, technologies, whatever the heck it was, uh, basically forbidden knowledge was being used. Uh, so the Inquisition will use that as an excuse for being, you know, to, to claim that they were been right for the start. Uh, at that point, uh, Kyber, the first battle of Kyber Pass was going on. So the troops were coming back. Uh, the temple, the, the actual Templars realized that something had been going on at home. And so the second, uh, Crusade was formed. So that's when the temple sent out troops along with the Inquisition to try and stop Durs from doing whatever he'd been doing. Uh, he hid in the desert, split the various runes they'd found with his followers. Uh, the runes were actually, um, from what I understand from the fluff, uh, old Sphinx. So that was one of the races that we never got to see because Rackham closed underneath beforehand, but they were basically the uh, counterparts to the Ophidians. So they had highly advanced tech. Uh, we can still see some of that with the Sinwall. I believe that the Sinwall uh, robots are all Sphinx tech. Again, this is my understanding. It might not be that at all, but from what little dots I could connect, it seems that there's a very clear link between the two of them. Uh, so, of course, in the desert, the various uh, Technomancers, followers, disciples of Durs, actually uh, founded the, each uh, their own labs. And so basically, the various cities in the desert, the various Durs cities, actually have the name of the founding alchemist. So the, the garrison of Danakil, Danakil was actually one of the disciples. Uh, Durs, of course, the, uh, the Empire, uh, 
characters with Ruin from Shamir. If I look at the map quickly, here somewhere. again, sorry, I am looking at the maps at the same time. Um, so Tenseth, uh, Theben, they were all various uh, alchemists who worked with them. Uh, each of them had their own ways of doing things, but for a the longest time, I remember Fluff uh, being about how Durs had given them the order to just create basic clones. Um, the basic clones are actually all have uh, are all basically clones of Durs. So the idea is that the Griffin troops coming into the desert would be faced with enemies, and every time they would kill that enemy, it would just be the same person over and over and over which apparently was, at least according to Fluff, was demoralizing because it felt like they would kill, you know, kept killing 200 times the same person and every time you un unmask them, it would just be the same person. So you, you wouldn't know whether or not you'd be making any progress into like deeper in the desert because you'd only ever meet the same, same troop, same person multiple times. Um, so one of, the, uh, one of the disciples, Danikil, actually argued that he could make a better clone, which would be more efficient. Uh, of course, there's berated him saying, no, no, this is what we're doing right now. Danikil still went and made a better clone behind his back, uh, which turned out to be the uh, down the, the, uh, the Sentinels, not Sentinels, but the Dawn Warriors. Uh, so he created Dawn Warriors. He created uh, the uh, a set of better warriors, which were the pillars of Danikil. And then uh, it gifted a, uh, the, the DNA of that branch of clones to Durs as a gift. Uh, Durs was incredibly annoyed, but he saw the potential and so said nothing. A few months later, uh, a single clone knocked at the door of the entire garrison, proceeded to beat all nine pillars to a bloody pulp and then murder Danikil. And the final word, his final word, the final words that I heard were, you have disobeyed for the last time. I'm here to take over uh, for Durs. So that was basically the first Commodore to have been created. Uh, he is still around, as in that was, so that was basically around 676. Uh, the current Dawn Ritual happens at, uh, at 1000. So that's about... 330 years later, uh, the clones keep going. Basically, when a clone reaches at the end of its life lifespan, the DNA is harvested and reused again. So you do have clone, uh, not quite bloodlines, but clone lines. So sometimes, uh, for example, the, the uh, Dawn Warrior character, the Sentinel Danikil uh, Thysenka, is actually a descendant of one of the Nine Pillars. That's basically where we heard about the pillars the first time, along with Cry Havoc 1, if I'm, mistaken, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that was there, the rack of deep dive into that bit of history in there. Um, but yes, basically, there are supposed to be eight other pillars that we've never heard of or never actually got more fluff on. Uh, they're basically supposed to be really tough, really powerful Dawn Warriors. And then uh, the Commodore is still the same a descendant of this or at least a clone of the same clone uh he is described in the opening segment in the ragnarok fluff actually and he's meant to be a uh extremely good general he is tactical he's you know methodical um, and he's also in the fluff he can see uh, immortal beings who are supposed to be invisible so what that means we don't know but we know that he He's apparently very uh, impressive as a, as a general. Uh, so basically, there's uh, at this point, just give me a second. I am quickly. So Durs got assassinated not that long later. I can't actually find out which year exactly, but that was between that one and I believe the Revolt of the Orcs, if I'm not mistaken as the orcs were a Durs creation. The alchemists were looking for slave labor uh, and they grabbed a few goblins, experimented on them and created the orcs from there. Uh, 
but this being their first creation, uh, they also created them to be, uh, oh, what's the word? Uh, they can actually, uh, they, they can breed. So they thought it'd be easier to have slave races that could breed. And that meant that the orcs actually managed to get into to have an uprising. They actually revolted, uh, fled the cities of the desert and hid in the canyons beyond. Uh, so that was the orcs of the, uh, the, the Brano Corps, which was the, the canyon section. There was a splinter group, which wasn't part of the original fluff, but got quickly uh, explained in the uh, in one of the Cry Havocs and became a popular faction, which was the Behemoth, but that's besides the point. We're still going on with Durs. Um, so Durs basically managed to um, not quite settle the desert, but at least keep it long enough to be able to hold it and, and have the kind of manpower and, and creature power to defend it, which means that the various uh, crusade of the Griffin against Durs has been stalemated for pretty much since the heresy. Uh, I'm just looking for a quick... Uh, yep. Yes, okay, so it is after the... Yep, okay, so I've just found a quick passage. So yes, the actual... So the... the after the uh, orc uprising, there was a, an actual, some sort of attack against the capital city uh, where everything got raised. Uh, the attackers were not found. This I know because I actually asked a question to a Rackham employee at one of the Q&A at during Gen Con. Uh, of course, the answer was caused more questions. We, we the group, the, uh, North American Federation had a quick meetup at Gen Con in 05, where they actually had an employee answer questions. Each member could ask a single question and get an answer. Uh, of course, some of the answers were not very useful. Um, my question was, do we know who actually attacked the Capitol? Because we had not had any hints or any further bits of fluff about this. All we know is that uh, when you look at the map, there is an old Shamir ruin in the desert, and then there's a new capital city. And, and there's a passage in the Ragnarok fluff about how the city got raised, and then uh, Durs was found you know, mortally wounded in, in the remain, you know, remaining bits of the city, and, but the attackers were never found. So my question was, do we know who attacked them? And the answer I got was, Durs from the future. So again, that, that was the only answer I got. I did not get any more than that. That was a single sentence and that was all I got for an answer. Uh, but of course, everyone got that kind of answer. So that was part of the fun, trying to figure out how that worked into it. For uh, uh, one of the answers we got, I know I'm, I'm digressing a bit, uh, but the, the one person for me asked the question, who is Mira? Because Mira is one of the Griffin heroes who happens to be uh, adopted. But we, we didn't know who she was. We don't know who her true parents are. We don't know anything. And the answer was, Mira is married. That's, that's the only answer we got. We don't know more than that. So again, every answer, every answer we got was more questions to be asked. Uh, I do wish I had compiled them. That would have been a lot more fun. Unfortunately, it was pretty late already and it actually went on till 3 a.m. in the morning. So yeah, that was, that was insane, but that was fun. So uh, Durs basically is dead or in uh, suspended animation beneath Shamir as uh, future Durs, which we are not aware of, attacked for whatever reason. Uh, the revolt of the orcs happened in 852. So this points about 150 years to the actual dawn ritual, which triggers Ragnarok. Um, we have hints, again, knowing this, if we look at what happens, we have hints that some of the clones are trying to start an uprising. Uh, Sazia is leading one of her factions. Uh, if you look at the uh, lab, 
pack the various sub faction structures that are playable in Contradiction 3.5. Um, there is a group of, of rebellious clones. So my I, my thinking of this is that they would actually go back to try and prevent the dawn ritual from happening earlier or something else like that, but at least try to prevent a catastrophe from happening due to Durs being so full of himself that he'd do something like this. Uh, the dawn ritual was something that was known earlier. Um, there were uh, hints of it. Again, I'll, I'll kind of answer one of the community questions we had. Uh, there, it, it was known. There was something about the dawn ritual being already uh, more nations were aware of it, but no one thought Durs would actually do it early on. Uh, at this point, when Darn Ritual is beginning, um, it's, it's something else entirely. Things have, have been set into motion. Uh, but yeah, I mean, from the time when the orcs revolted to the current day, current day of Ragnarok, uh, Durs have actually figured out how to create their own clones, but they are actually non viable. So they are, they're, they're sterile. Uh, they are based on humans and possibly um, some of these Sphinx tech that they've managed to figure out how to work. Uh, we have some of the characters like Sinisiris, who is described in his own fluff as a prototype of a new sort of clone, new sort of clone. And uh, in, in the hybrid fluff, if you follow on the various card fluff could they, each card had a bit of fluff in the back um sin actually discovers that the hybrids in the old labs which were a set of labs that got sealed when Durs died are actually based on his designs so he may be a new sort of clone but he is based on older designs or the older designs are based on him so again this is bring back to the whole issue that there will be there were there were going to be shenanigans with clones going back trying to prevent something or something else but yes uh, there have been hints here and there that things might move in a circular fashion time wise for for durs okay very interesting so far right yeah I didn't know all. I, I had no idea, but I, I, some of the names and some of the things you brought up it triggers memories of reading the cards or having the miniatures and that kind of thing. But I didn't know where they fell in in the sense of where they fell into the story. I just knew them by name. A, a lot of the clones, yeah. a lot of the stuff, we didn't have much. Uh, I was only made aware that there was there were sections for some characters in the English version of the Ragnarok fluff book, uh, which means I will be reading out of that up very quickly because uh, that's stuff I, I was not aware of. If I do know that some of the fluff in the Ragnarok book differs from the one in the French, uh, mainly in the case that some of the articles in Cry Havoc had come out. So sometimes they updated the fluff a bit to fit it in. Um, but so far I, I need to sit, to sit down and, and buckle through and see if there are any differences between the two, uh, but I do know that the Ragnarok, uh, if there's some fluff about some of the characters, I will definitely read that up, but yes, uh, because some of the characters, we had very little background on them. Uh, I'm thinking Vargas, I'm thinking uh, Archeon Sanath apparently has an article section in uh, the Rag book, which I was not aware of. Yeah. Because all I know of him is that he was, he's a basically the equivalent of war criminal, uh, he is wanted for destruction of a uh, Griffin trading post, but I did not know anything more than that. So interesting, uh, definitely worth looking up into. Uh, but yes, I uh, this is, again, this is just a broad overview of the, the various Durs uh, as a faction. I mean, each character, some characters, more popular ones, had more fluff. I mean, Sazia was uh, actually a pretty developed character compared to some of the others. Uh, Isis and um, Sin were some of the others, mainly because of hybrid and that they've been brought in uh, through there. You had, so the Karis, um, Karis Vargas had a little fluff. This one had a bit, but not that much. Uh, Luker 
uh, Cypher who can actually had a, a bit, uh, mainly because of at least one uh, public event at one of the French conventions, actually had a campaign going on in Tencent, which is his home base. So he got he got some action, he got some love. But yeah, uh, some of the mages, I mean, uh, mages and priests didn't get all that much love either. So we don't have all that much about who they are or where they come from. Uh, they did get some background in Cryo the uh, Age of Ragnarok, which I believe sometimes is a bit cleaned up. Uh, the, the fluff did get messy, but uh, on the whole, it sounds like it was pretty much what they wanted to do to begin with. So again, uh, for, for you know more precision about characters, more precision detail you know, on, on who or what they're doing, uh, I'd probably take a bit more time to go through all of those as well. Okay, now in regards to the to the magic and the magic law that the Durs use, what kind of spells and what kind of magic do they use, this faction? Okay, uh, Durs are known for using two types of magic. Uh, they use uh, technomancy and they use biopsy. Technomancy is described, actually all magic paths. Uh, this was a bit of um, where Confrontation took a bit more of an RPG approach to magic and, and miracles and spells. Uh, they had paths of magic a bit like D&D did back then. Uh, mages knew elements and they knew paths. And this is also very confusing to new players because they're like, so elemental is, I don't have elemental as a path on the card, but I can use it. And, and it's like, yes, uh, you, every mage can use uh, primagy, uh, basically it's primordial magic. It's just cantrips basically. And elemental, which is the using the various elements that they've learned to work with, but in their raw form. So uh, there is generally no magic in uh, darkness. So they use darkness gems. And I believe the other elements is earth. Uh, Sezia is the one that knows earth and darkness. And uh, Kale knows darkness. And in his second incarnation has picked up fire. Uh, but we, since the, they're basically the only two mages we ever got, that was it. Uh, the other mages we have were all uh, warrior mages. So that's basically single element and more um, uh, combat oriented magic. They're, they're basically spells that are easier to cast, but they're more effective for combat. Um, Confrontation really messes a lot of players up because it doesn't have a lot of direct damage spells. It's a lot of buffing, it's a lot of a debuff, and it's really, it's never, or at least the, the, the most spells are never really outright, I will kill something. It's more of a, I will do effects to help my, my actual beat sticks do the trick. Um, so Technomancy is a lot of um, self, or at least a lot of buffing. Uh, you have spells that will actually re regenerate troops. You have spells that were actually um, uh, one of the spells was actually allow a 360 field of view. Uh, so basically, you know, enhanced senses, um, and that's there's technomancy, and then biopsy is the um, warrior mage style type of magic. Most races, most nations, or however you define them, have two. Uh, Biopsy is more of a, the, what's the, um, the tenets, not technomancers, I'm sorry, I am trying to remember the name of the troop. It's the guys with the hats, the biopsists. The biopsists oh, use right. actually biopsy. Uh, they have, for example, spells that will cause pain to an, an opponent to prevent them from being able to focus well on actual combat. Uh, spells that actually help uh, detect enemies within a certain range. Basically, they they will actually improve their senses. Um, sometimes they will actually be able to draw uh, a bit of mana from dying clones. So if a clone is dying next to them, they can actually just finish the clone off and actually get a bit of mana back. Uh, it's a lot of, again, a lot of buffs. I will, oh, look. Whereas Technomancy might be a bit of buff, this one might be a bit, it's buff and debuff more more than anything uh, but yes it's uh, the, the last few army lists i made were a lot of oh look i'm gonna 
walk up to an ally and buff their mutagenic rolls, or you know, you'll this this trooper cannot fail mutagenic roll this turn, or it's it's a lot of okay, let's try to put things to our advantage. It's a lot of using technology in, in a magical form, or at least you know, combining them. And again, it fits for the faction. Cool. Okay. Uh, now you're talking about this dawn ritual before. Okay, the uh, dawn ritual was the uh, the opening f- bit of fiction for the Ragnarok book. Uh, it was basically the beginning, or at, it's it's the moment that there's basically push the big red button and, and say, okay, we're, we're ready to go to war, and that means that we're dragging everyone with us. Uh, Rackham had given off, uh, I think it was a month of little like quotes before they released the book. Uh, every day had a little quote from another character or uh, other notary, uh, notable of, of the game. Uh, so some people were aware of it. Some some ambassadors, some kings were didn't know that the, uh, the dawn ritual was a thing that might happen at some point. Uh, the common man probably didn't. Uh, basically, I know that there's actually close the borders and recall the ambassadors or close the embassies in advance. I can't remember how long in advance. I know there's a bit of fiction in there about something like that. But basically it's every there's faith, every faithful, every priest in the entire nation joined in and basically a wood got their god to awaken and uh, possibly inhabit the body of the, the high priest so they got their god to be incarnated mm-hmm. um, one of the bits of fluff or one of the the quotes beforehand was i like i'm sure it was a historical quote they, they redirected or were kind of you know, used but it was about how you can tell how great a nation is by the the number and quality of its enemies and and of course the quote continues like and now we will have the entire world against us let us show that we are going to be the greatest and that that was basically a quote from like the high the, the high priest or the uh the, the dirge leader of at the time of the ritual i'm like okay so they are going all out and they want it's it's a question of at this point they are being aggressive they're basically awakening every single creature they have in their bats they're basically pulling out everything uh, the god they, they've made they've made it so that god is walking on the earth. Uh, that's also an answer to a question uh, that was asked by the community. There's no actual definitive fluff proof of this because it wasn't really revisited. But the undertones and what the um, suggest what it's being suggested as yes, Artolf, the god of the Durs, is actually now on Arklash. Uh, I believe the coming of the devourers is what caused this. Uh, I know uh, the fluff for Salius. Uh, Salius was actually had more fluff than most people thought. Uh, his original incarnation had a quest, which was him basically creating um, the C1. So the first incarnation had a quest line with him because he was the Durst Venturer, which was uh, the incarnation models, uh, incarnation characters for uh, that, that mode of play. Uh, and he basically had a quick quest line where he was Frankensteining a, a zombie and, and then animating, animating it through um, technological means. Uh, but there was also a Durst card pack uh, for scenarios, which had three or three scenario in there. And one of them was actually the first bit of a quest line, which will be followed in continued in uh, Salia Sessa's second incarnation. So the Confrontation 2 blister actually had a different set of quests and it continued the one in the original card quest. Uh, the card quest original one ended uh, in a monolith in the middle of the desert during a sandstorm. And basically, it's it went ellipses as to what happened. Basically, the, the character touches the monolith and then just blanks. 
Sal yes yes at second incarnation uh, starts with uh, the, the quest line starts with him just being dragging himself back to the nearest I think uh, one of the cities of the, their cities where the um, again we're going to answer another question for the community where the main uh, gene uh, library is uh, the I I might answer that further you know with more details later but it, it was a point where uh, some of the cities each have their own gene libraries, but one of them has a major one. I believe it's Ishmael or it's quickly looking over. It's not the Ben. It's not Tarsit. No, Tarsit is the one for. Sorry. I think Tarsit is the one for Saifalukan, not the Ben. But yes, basically one of them. Is, is known to be the, the library. This is where most experiments take place. This is where, and basically, Salius stumbles to the main gate, bloody, battered, almost, almost and near death, uh, gets patched up, and realizes he's got about a month of blank memories, and decides to go hunt back where he's been and, and track down what he's been doing in that month. Uh, so that's basically what the, the whole set of missions is until the last one where he stands in front, you know, stands and, and has to race a, his opponent to the monolith, which has been unveiled again. And as he touches it, realizes that he's getting a glimpse into the mind of the god of Durs. And basically, he's touched the mind of, of Artolf twice, which is what has been dri driving him insane. Because again, might of mortal, might of God, kind of not really able to comprehend it. Uh, and again, blanks, as, but this time remembers that he's been doing that. And as he blanks, he sees a comet go by overhead and he realizes that time's short. And that comet is actually a link to the Wolfen, which is when the Devourers come to play. Okay, wow. So yeah. yes, Salius yeah. is basically the harbinger of is he's the one who brought the message that now we need to start Dawn Ritual now because we're, there's going to be a reckoning if we don't. Because the devourers are basically there for that. Okay. So, yes. Wonderful, Eric. That's excellent, mate. You've got such a wealth of knowledge of all this stuff. I don't know how you can retain it all. <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's been over a decade and I still remember all of it, which is, yeah. or at least most of it, which is yeah. even to me shocking at times. I'm fairly sure that if I got back to a confrontation table and I would actually watch a game, I could probably still play without too much trying to remember what the heck that was. And that part of me is really, really in shock that I've, I've retained that much knowledge of it. When, when you talk about the card packs, um, that's one of the best things I thought about the some of the characters in confrontation is that, you know, for example, Kanye the Savage, he's got this um, act kind of act one, act two, act three mm -hmm. kind of scenarios that you can play. Yes. And I thought that's a wonderful little, uh, well, it gives a bit of a backdrop to the, to the scenario and the narrative of the, of the it game. Was, it was, it was, it was basically a more of a uh, role playing. It, it felt more like a role playing game turned into a, a miniature game, which was one of the appeals of confrontation. And uh, one of the disappointments of confrontation three, when they just said, we don't do this anymore. And none of this is valid. Yeah, and that's what I really didn't like about when I realized that when I think Silvano told me, he's going to laugh when I mention his name again. But yeah, I think he told me that they dropped all that, which is really sad. I think I'm the, going to play all those scenarios oh, where the... It's, the scenarios are still playable. It's just that the way it worked was that between scenarios, you could get uh, you could get experience points, where you, which you could spend to buy a little bonuses or get yourself like uh, feats. So basically you had a, a hand of cards when if you accomplished one of the feet, like the condition on the card, you would actually get a special ability you could use during the, the rest of the game uh, for the rest oh, of the actual cool. smarts section of campaign. So like scenario one, got it in scenario one and use it during scenario two and then, then scenario three. Uh, but yes, they call, actually I asked the designer because the designer of Contra 3 was at Gen Con when it released. And I asked him, why didn't you, you know, tell people that we wouldn't be able to use it because card packs were still being sold up to 
the release of Confrontation 3. He's like, we told management, the management just didn't do anything about it. So it was not just the uh, the actual scenario packs, it was also the magic packs and the, uh, the, the miracle packs. So you actually had extra spells and extra uh, free spells you could get that would actually allow you to have more choices as to what you wanted to do. So each uh, type of magic had a main, so each main type of magic had a, path, a pack. So you could get, for example, a, a necromancy pack, you get a, a technomancy pack, and then each of those packs had a couple spells for the minor path for that, that faction. So for example, if you got necromancy, then you might have some Zerkaeus for the, um, uh, the, the, the weird ghost guys for, uh, that, that do the uh, warrior mages for the ram. Or if you had biopsy, biopsy spells in the technomancy pack, for the biopsists, that made sense. And sure, most of these spells weren't amazing. You had a couple of broken ones here and there. There were a couple of really majorly broken ones, but you you know that. But it still gave you more options than just the one of the, the few spells that were available in the blisters. Uh, C three took away the packs, but he gave a, a list of spells in the book. Uh, I mean. It worked, it, they were thematically very appropriate, but you didn't have as much variety in them. And even admittedly, if you didn't use all the spells in the packs, uh, you, you'd get like one or two packs because of a single spell in there. But if you wanted to play for fun, you had a lot more variety and you had a lot more mm. ideas. But again, that was, that was their decision, they stopped uh, the, 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 most of the spells that wouldn't work in C3 because of the way the mechanics have changed uh, since you activate the model and the model performs its actions so when you activate it instead of going through phases like you did in Confrontation 2, that did change things. So it's understandable, but it was also a bad, it should have given us more heads up for that, but yes. Uh, so yeah, these scenarios are still playable. They won't work for the actual uh, incarnation mode because that wouldn't work at all in c3 but you can still completely play them and some of them are actually pretty wild mm -hmm. okay sounds interesting all right great okay mate. well i think we'll now we'll uh, we'll go into our community questions to be answered sure. and thank you very much for the three people <laughs> who gave us some questions but hey it's better than nothing so uh, so yes, so uh, again, I answered a couple of questions quickly in passing. I might try to do it more in depth now. Uh, so I'm seeing a couple of questions from uh, Keith, Keith McCoy on, on forums, uh, who's asking um, lots of lore, lots of lore seems to take place in the point of the Dawn ritual, which is basically start Ragnarok, which yes, it is. Uh, is there any, was there any rumor that the ritual is going to happen outside those members of the Muters of Darkness? Or did it completely, uh, completely take those of Light and Destiny by surprise? Uh, it didn't. Like I said, the, there wasn't much fluff that had been published. Rackham did do a couple of bits online, unfortunately. Trying to find that, I mean, at this point, is, is a fool's errand, because unless someone saved it on their hard drive, uh, there's not a lot left of Rackham and what they did online. Um, but yes. The ambassador, ambassadors and high ranking off, uh, officials in some nations were aware that the Radar ritual was something that could happen or that it, it existed. Uh, but the average individual on in Arclash was blissfully unaware of it. Uh, so his second question was about the Noctis project, which is based in on question mark. Uh, is Ram Vassalius, which we spoke of, and serves as a collection of rare genetic material. Is this the master collection of genetic material for Dur's army? Uh, no, there is a, G, um, a gene library somewhere in the desert, which is kept safe. Uh, Biopsists have, according to Fluff, been the ones who are sent out with squads to uh, basically take samples of various creatures, beings, or anything of interest. Uh, they are left to their own devices to do that and then come back and share that. The Cadwallon 
would probably the my way of seeing is that the Kedwalan not just project faction, whatever you call it, would be a sub faction, which was again would be given leeway, but having a um, different port of call so that other uh, so Cesalius and whoever he decides to or whoever needs to, to deal with him can actually have a different port of call as Kedwalan's on the other side of Arclash. Um, this is what I didn't quite like about the various faction packs is that they didn't give a lot of fluff about the factions. It was basically, here's this faction, here's the, the leader of that faction, and here's the bonuses. Uh, we didn't get to see a lot of it. Uh, some of them did get looked at in the Cryavics, but not a lot and not enough, I think. Uh, again, a lot of the Goblin factions, for example, I would have loved to see more of because we didn't get a lot of that. We got a lot of Nodan Kar, we got a lot of the uh, Asian themed goblins, we didn't get much of that. And that's also what I think would have been really cool for some of the fluff for the Durs, because Noctis had a great idea. Did it work? I'm not quite sure, but it could have been a really cool to actually get more fluff about what happened and what their actual mission is. Uh, Sally is there to try and deal with the various factions that are in Cadwallon so that he can get easily, he can uh, have access to various sources of materials, genetic material more easily, maybe. Would he be the best choice? Maybe not, because he's kind of insane, as we mentioned earlier. But then again, it could also be a good way to have a, a, a you know, dirt cell in a neutral city which can then be used for a port of call for whatever teams of gatherers to be sent out. So again, not a lot of background fluff on that, but that was my take on it. Um, and then the other question he had was, did Artolf have a physical presence in Arclash after the Dawn Ritual? Uh, that's, again, not quite mentioned, but the end of the Ragnarok opening fiction was that the high priest, uh, the Magon, had actually now been containing Artoth, which was what the Darn Ritual was all about. So he might not be physically himself, but he does have an actual conduit, a direct conduit, which would be the, uh, the high priest. So my take on it is yes, not a physical presence as in his divine self being physically present, but he does have a body that he has access to and he can use. I'm not quite sure how Ellis and uh, the Devourers did it, because Ellis was the counterpart and the one that actually uh, did all of that with Filtis and Devourers. So I'm not quite sure how that one worked, but it would make sense to have a counterpart as those are basically the two gods which have begun the entire conflict. Um, and then the last question I'm seeing is from Hedley Kopak, which is, I've heard rumors from French speakers that Artolf is from the future of Arclash. Is that correct? I'm not quite sure if Artolf is from the future of Arclash. I do know he is a technological god, which may have been influenced, uh, again, he may have influenced the uh, Sphinx back in the day, and then lay dormant until uh, Durs and his acolytes found the, the text, the technology, and everything. And since they had a darkness bent, turned slightly. Again, it's not entirely clear, but there's a direct link between the two of them. Uh, it, as for the sea from future, I'm not quite sure. I do know, like I said, there was something about the future going on. And there were a number of tidbits about troops or style of clones or technology that should not be if it's as advanced, but was, or there's a weird timeline dissonance there that's actually very interesting and worth exploring further. But Artolf himself from future, I'm not quite sure. He is the God of conquest. So maybe, maybe not. He, he's been around since a lot longer though, so. Uh, looking quickly at the timeline from the first first book, 
uh, the god, the winter of battle happened in the year zero. And so the apparition of the Wolfen and the exile of the gods from our clash was previous to that. How long? That's a good question, but since the winter of battles, what spawned the whole creation of time? It could have been centuries. It could it, there was no time before then, so hard to judge. Okay, very interesting. Okay, well, thank you very much for those community members who put some questions forward for Eric to answer today, and I hope you got your, the answers you you had wanted. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, if people have more questions they want to ask about certain characters um, or about anything about the specifically about the law for the Durs, please uh, let us know by going to the Facebook group at the Confrontation 3.5 Fanatics group, or you can uh, email me and I will send them on to Eric and forward them to him at the crown of command at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, we can put those for you, forward to you, mate. So just to give people a bit of a teaser for next time we chat, what faction would you like to pick next time, Eric? That's a good question. Um, what faction would you like me to just... Well, have, have we put around? it to a vote? We put it to the vote for the community on the 3.5 Fanatics group on Facebook and see what, what, uh, which one gets the biggest shout out. Sure, that'd be, that'd be a lot of fun. I'd be curious to see which one the community wants to, uh, to take a look at next. Yeah, me too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, of course, I'm looking forward to the dwarves and the goblins, but I'm sure other people have <laughs> <laughs> their own their own faction they want to want to um, have a have a look at uh, in more detail. So, again, Eric, thank you very much again for coming and, and taking your time to talk to us. You're quite welcome. And uh, we look forward to the next chat, mate. We have on the next deep dive on an, on another faction. But yeah, I've got some other questions I might want to ask you about uh, Durs as well, because thinking back, um, you know, like the Kratos and all the other different various clones, mm -hmm. they were they created after Durs was assassinated or during his time by different uh, alchemists? Or... It's a good question. Um, the creation of the, the Dawn Warriors were the first ones created. Again, mm -hmm. Danakil just went behind his back. But the, the Kratos, my take on the Kratos is that they're, not quite finished they, they're workable they, they do the job but i don't think they're as polished as they should have been or were meant to be uh due to the fact that they still have these weird growths and then and weird insect parts um they are definitely more aggressive than the average human being and definitely you no know, hypertrophy it's a lot more muscle mass um but the question the, the real question is uh, when were they created is so far unknown uh, the last few releases Rackham did was basically the um, the new uh, crossbowmen, the hybrids, and the Jadaris clones, and those were felt more robotic than actual clones. Um, so that might be where theirs had been going. So I want to say probably after he died before the uh, the Dawn Ritual happened. So again, that's pretty broad, but. Uh, the description I've seen of the science of cloning is that it's not quite science as much as, as an art. Mm -hmm. There's some bases that they know of, but there's a lot of experiments and even clones that should be working fine sometimes are flawed. Most of them get recycled and used for food stuff, which is what happens to recycled clones. Um, but sometimes you have a clone that's that might be defective, but still works well enough. And the defect is actually a bonus, uh, such as Sazia actually being able to use magic, which she should not have been able to. Mm. Uh, so they will keep those clones. Uh, Salius actually was a clone that should have been uh, pulped for and, and, and recycled, but wasn't. He had originally been meant to be the uh, Inuka Commodore and was found to be defective while still in the vat. And when he was about to be recycled, slated for this recycling, uh, either the Magon or Jabril's with the Traveler, who is a, this weird behind the scenes puppet master. He seems to be, again, I've only seen him mentioned once or twice, and that was basically the Ragnarok fluff and this specific part uh, intervened saying that 
Salius was actually important to the destiny of Durs as, as a nation. So did he know that he'd be touched by God somehow? Probably, because the tribe of Jabril seems to know a lot of weird things that he's not supposed to. So maybe he's the actual time traveler. Again, I'm not quite sure. Uh, that character had actually been retconned in H. Ragnarok to be Archeon Sadath. So who knows? Okay, well, there's a lot more, lot more questions and answers that we unpacked here. So people can leave comments here on the YouTube video. That'd be much better. So that way you can interact with them directly then. Eric, sure. And through the uh, Facebook group as well. So yeah, we want we want to uh, open up, you know, you know, broaden our conversations about um, the law and factions, and just about the game generally, just to stir some interest with some uh, beloved fans or new people coming into the game or universe. So um, as people may have played the computer game, I don't know if you're if you're a if you're a fan of the, um, the I think it's Cyanide, Stu Cyanide Studios who released a computer game for they did. They released a couple of them. I got one oh, of them. Right for free, I think was a giveaway and I managed to snag it. Yeah. I played for about half an hour before turning it off and <laughs> never playing again. It wasn't bad, but it's just that I, I think a game crashed and that just took out like 20 minutes of my gameplay. And I'm like, uh, I don't feel like starting over from scratch. And yeah. I never could get the motivation again because it was, it was RTS style, but it felt like a dungeon crawl and it didn't feel quite finished. Right. It was it was bad, but it was it was just something missing. So, but I've heard that their second one was closer to, to what it was, and that one I, I would want to try and play at some point. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I saw some videos on on YouTube about it. I've never played it myself, but it might be a good way for people to you know um, get to know more about the fluff or lore through this the through the story of that particular game because it's got the Griffins as being, you know, the main um, protagonists against the mm -hmm. Durs and they're sort of going through the, the desert and having to kill lots of clones and that kind of thing from the look of it. So, yeah. Okay, cool, mate. Thank you very much again. I won't take up any more of your time, mate. So have a it's, great weekend. It's a pleasure. And uh, hopefully I'll get to, to uh, join you soon. Yep, yeah, definitely. Thanks, Eric. All right. Bye.